A good monster is indispensable to a good horror film. And the VHS franchise, born from the creative mind of producer Brad Miska, had become a revered cornerstone in the world of found footage horror anthologies. From alien encounters to supernatural terrors and human threats, the VHS series caters to the diverse tastes of horror aficionados. With five films that have come to define the anthology series, thrilling highs and chilling lows, it's high time to revisit these cinematic treasures. This franchise has earned its reputation as a beloved horror anthology, boasting an array of creative and spine-tingling short films crafted by some of the genre's most brilliant contemporary filmmakers, including names like David Bruckner, Ty West, and Chloe Akuno. These films, each encased a chilling wraparound story, feature a multitude of shorts that explore a wide spectrum of horror subgenres. With a new VHS film set for release later this year, we thought it was the correct time to explore all 20 of the monsters from the franchise. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. <sighs> Succubus, Amateur Night, VHS 2012. In Amateur Night, the succubus is rightly portrayed as a sinister and unapologetically demonic entity. This story revolves around a group of friends seeking to record an amateur adult film but end up recording their most disturbing and final encounter with the malevolent and violent lover. Their night doesn't quite begin on an innocent note, as they rent a motel room and even get spectacles with a hidden camera and a microphone. In the end, they do manage to pick up a couple of girls, one of whom was Lily. It soon becomes evident that Lily is far from ordinary, an aura of strangeness surrounds her from the very beginning. Upon returning to the motel, things become a bit raunchy with Lily while the other woman passes out. But of course, Lily is no ordinary woman. She seizes control of the situation and shows that she's dominant. The violent and lethal succubus, a demon on the prowl for unsuspecting victims in the bar, had found three stupid men desperate for action, but only one could be her lover. So who was going to be the lucky guy? She had fanged teeth, clawed feet, and a hauntingly deformed skull. Furthermore, she was not much of a talker and probably had the vocabulary of a four-year-old. As the night grew darker, the succubus abandoned any pretense of seduction and unleashed her violent, hedonistic desires. From biting a victim's palm to a grotesque act of general mutilation, she held no qualms about getting herself dirty, with blood of course. Another unfortunate soul who falls under her spell meets a gruesome end as she seemingly devours him in the throes of passion. In the end, she takes her chosen one, stretches her wings, and flies into the sky. Of course, his fate was going to be gruesome, but how much? David Bruckner's film strips away the romanticized veneer often associated with succubus, and it seemed that the name Lily is possibly a homage to the legendary Lilith. In her rawest and most unfiltered form, a true embodiment of the demonic essence with no regard for charm or conversational finesse. The Lesbian Killer, Second Honeymoon, VHS 2012. Written and directed by Ty West, Second Honeymoon is about Sam and Stephanie, a couple who travel to Arizona to celebrate their honeymoon. The couple later meets a woman who asks Sam for a ride the following day, but that's that. At the end of the film, Sam is murdered by a masked killer who turns out to be the same woman. Furthermore, it's revealed that this woman and Stephanie were having an affair. Stephanie's lover was not your usual killer. On the first day, she made contact with Sam her target, and probably analyzed everything she could about him. That night, she barged into their room, much like a stalker prowls before pouncing. She then went on to caress Stephanie's butt with a switchblade, which was grim and curious. Of course, she stole $100 from Sam's wallet before dipping his toothbrush in the toilet. So she truly hated Sam. She probably knew beforehand that she would be killing Sam, but that wasn't enough. She needed to subject him to a certain humiliation. But Stephanie's lover also recorded the entire entire ordeal, and for her last act, she killed Sam by plunging her knife into his neck. The man died choking in his own blood, and the two lovers made out, unaffected by the fact that they had recently killed a man in cold blood. The Glitch Tuesday the 17th, VHS 2012. Joey, Samantha, Spider, and Wendy go to a secluded forest lake. Wendy, the newest member of the group, 
would go to the place every year, and this time, the three others tagged along. During the walk from the car to the lake, they come across some disturbing scenes like mutilated animals, but more importantly, a feeling of dread had consumed the entire area, filling the air with an eerie discomfort. Moreover, Wendy keeps telling them strange ideas, like how her friends once died in the same place, or how Joey, Samantha, and Spider were going to die that day. The first to die is Samantha. A figure with a red, featureless face puts a knife through her skull. It turns out that the killer is called Glitch, because of the effect it creates when being filmed. One by one, it takes down the friends, and even Wendy, who had coerced the three others to come with her. In reality, her original friends had been killed by Glitch the previous year, and she had brought Samantha, Joey, and Spider as baits to capture or kill the Glitch. So the Glitch had been haunting the area for quite a few years now, and must have claimed multiple lives. Furthermore, the poltergeist-like entity kills its victims using just about anything in its surroundings. It can slash your throat or simply smash your head with your own camera. Wendy had set up traps for Glitch, but even those don't stop it from finally killing Wendy. The Glitch is seemingly invincible to the naked eye, but can be vaguely captured by a camera. Glitch not only proved to be a skilled slasher killer, but also a sadist supernatural entity. If we think about it, the Glitch bears an uncanny resemblance with the cloaking device of a Predator from the Predator franchise, but has all the undertones of a slasher like Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers. Alleged cases of poltergeists have existed at least since 1654, when the Scottish mathematician and demonologist George Sinclair mentioned the poltergeist called the Glengluce Devil in his book Satan's Invisible World Discovered. Nevertheless, the glitch is a fine amalgamation of several movie monsters, making it unique. Back to your left. Emily. The Sick Boyfriend and the Aliens the sick thing that happened to Emily when she was younger. VHS 2012. In this segment, directed by Joe Swanberg, the story is shown through a series of computer video chats, gradually revealing James and the aliens as the central antagonist in Emily's harrowing ordeal. James, who is Emily's boyfriend and aspiring doctor, initially appears to be a supportive figure in Emily's life. However, as the story progresses, it becomes evident that he is deeply complicit in a sinister and nefarious scheme. He not only disregards Emily's well-being, but actively participates in the disturbing events transpiring in her life. The primary villains, though, are the aliens. Initially disguised as ghostly apparitions, they torment Emily both psychologically and physically. These extraterrestrial beings exploit Emily as an unwitting incubator for their hybrid offspring, subjecting her to horrifying procedures and erasing her memory to maintain their secret operations. James, ultimately revealed to be colluding with the aliens, willingly assists in the removal of alien fetuses from Emily's body, which shows his complete lack of empathy or concern for her well-being. His collaboration with the aliens is obviously grim in itself, but what makes him worse is that he makes Emily believe that something is wrong with her brain and that he deserves better than her. So you see, he contributes to Emily's physical and emotional trauma. Furthermore, the revelation that James is involved with multiple victims, all bearing the same telltale bump on their arms, underscores the extent of this cold-hearted nature. The Witch, 1031-98, VHS 2012. In 1031-98, a group of friends mistakenly attends a Halloween party at the wrong location. During their misadventures, they encounter a mysterious and enigmatic witch who plays a pivotal role in the chilling events that unfold. The witch, initially disguised as a young woman in distress, is found suspended from the rafters in the attic of a house where the friends have wandered. At first, the friends mistake the situation for a haunted house attraction and playfully join in the chant of cast you down being directed at the woman. However, their involvement inadvertently alerts the men performing the exorcism leading to a violent confrontation. But the situation soon spirals out of control, and the witch's true nature comes to light. She possesses supernatural powers, and she manipulates the environment to violently dispatch her captors. Ghostly arms emerge from walls and floors, exacting retribution against those who held her captive. Later, as the friends attempt to rescue her and escape the house, they come to the startling realization that the woman they rescued is, in fact, a witch. Her abilities extend beyond mere illusion as she escapes from the vehicle, reappearing on the street amidst a flock of birds, 
the friends find themselves trapped on the train tracks, unable to start their car or unlock their doors. In the end, an oncoming train smashes into the car, killing everyone inside. The witch initially appears as a damsel in distress, but ultimately becomes the minion of death and destruction. Curiously Cursed Ocular Implants Phase 1 Clinical Trials VHS 2, 2013 In Phase 1 clinical trials directed by Adam Wingard and written by Simon Barrett, the story revolves around cursed ocular and cochlear implants that conjure vengeful ghosts. Herman Middleton, the protagonist, receives an experimental ocular implant to replace his damaged right eye. His doctor warns him of potential glitches due to the implant's experimental nature. Soon after the procedure, Herman begins experiencing eerie disturbances. Objects move inexplicably, and he encounters unsettling visions, including a bleeding, seemingly undead man and a young girl, who also appears lifeless. These apparitions are revealed to be ghosts haunting Herman due to the implant. The ghosts grow increasingly menacing as he pays more attention to them. Clarissa, a red-haired woman who experienced a similar situation with a cochlear implant, explains that the implant allows them to perceive the vengeful spirits. Removing the implants won't banish the ghosts, but will only prevent the individuals from seeing them. Later, Clarissa's uncle, a malevolent spirit, joins the haunting. Tragedy strikes when Clarissa is dragged into a pool by an unseen entity and drowns. Herman's efforts to save her are in vain. He attempts to flee but encounters the relentless ghosts again. In a final confrontation, Herman tries to remove the cursed ocular plant, but the spirits insert it into his throat, sealing his fate. The cursed implants serve as a conduit for their malevolent presence, leading to a series of disturbing and ultimately deadly encounters for the unfortunate recipients. Hey, hey, come on, we gotta go. <laughs> Zombies, a ride in the park. In a Ride in the Park, directed by Eduardo Sanchez and Greg Hale, with a screenplay by Jamie Nash, we get the good old zombies as the terrifying and relentless villains. The zombies in here were extremely aggressive, as they attacked just about anything that moved, including the protagonist, Mike, and others. They display a primal urge to consume human flesh, and their behavior is marked by violence and hostility. The infection is a prominent aspect of the zombie's nature. When a blood-covered woman initially seeking help bites Mike on the throat, she transforms him into a zombie. The zombies are relentless in their pursuit of their prey. Even after sustaining injuries or being temporarily incapacitated, they reanimate and continue their murderous rampage. Like most zombies, even these have a mob mentality. They act collectively, following noise and disturbances to locate potential victims. This was seen when they were drawn to a young girl's birthday party resulting in multiple casualties. However, there was something unique about them. Mike accidentally pocket dials his girlfriend, Amy, and hears her voice. In this moment, he seems to temporarily subdue his aggressive behavior, recognizing the horror of his situation. Ultimately, Mike ends his own life with a discarded shotgun. This decision reflects his awareness of the dire circumstances and a desire to spare others from the same fate. The Horned Demon, The Baphomet, Safe Haven, VHS 2, 2013. In Safe Haven, directed by Timo Chianto and Gareth Evans, the final villain is a monstrous entity referred to as Baphomet. This demon is based on a historical and mythological figure and seems to represent the worst aspects of human nature. The mythological Baphomet possesses the legs and head of a goat, complete with hooves and goat-like visage. It also has three prominent horns on its head, adding to its eerie and unsettling appearance. Additionally, it has with wings reminiscent of a large bird. However, the Baphomet as presented in the film was slightly different. Firstly, it came out in a horrifying and visceral manner from the womb of a pregnant woman, Lena. This portrayal aligns with the traditional symbolism and associations of the Baphomet with occult and esoteric beliefs. In the context of the film, the Baphomet's appearance serves as a shocking and terrifying climax to the story's descent into madness and supernatural horror. It adds a nightmarish dimension to the narrative, leaving viewers with a haunting and disturbing visual representation of this mythological entity. <laughs> Grey Alien – Slumber Party Alien Abduction VHS 2 2013 The monsters of this segment, directed by Jason Eisner, are the gray aliens, commonly referred to as Zeta Reticulans, or Greys. These beings are often associated with alleged alien sightings in the United States, 
with approximately 73% of such sightings involving gray aliens. Gray aliens are typically described as having grayish skin, humanoid in shape, but notably lacking external body features like ears, noses, or sexual organs. Their bodies are slender and their skeletal structure can be discerned due to their sleek appearance. In the film, a group of teenagers find themselves in a precarious situation when the parents of Gary, Randy, and Jen leave them alone for a night. The siblings invite friends over. Amidst their jokes and pranks, the group initially fails to notice the presence of the gray aliens. As night falls, a disturbance outside the house leads to a power outage and loss of communication. Shadows of unidentified figures loom near the door, prompting Zack to confront them with a firearm. However, Zack is unexpectedly abducted by the gray aliens. Subsequently, each member of the group is abducted, sealed in sleeping bags, and thrown into the nearby lake. The remaining three siblings, along with their pet dog, manage to escape the initial abduction attempt. However, the gray aliens persistently pursue them, eventually leading to their abduction as well. Really sure where he got the cloak. So the rumors are that Harry Houdini himself... Houdini's cloak, Dante the Great, VHS Viral 2014. In the segment, Dante the Great, directed and written by Greg Bishop, John McMullen, an amateur magician stumbles upon a remarkable artifact, a cloak once owned by the legendary Harry Houdini. The cloak possessed extraordinary powers, allowing its wearer to perform genuine magic. Embracing his newfound abilities, John adopts the stage name Dante the Great and rises to fame as a magician with unparalleled skills. However, he soon discovers a dark and horrifying secret about the cloak. It demands regular human sacrifices to fuel its magic. To satisfy this sinister requirement, John hires multiple female assistants and records their gruesome fate as he recites a dark incantation, which results in the cloak devouring them. However, Scarlet finds out about Greg's secret and reports him to the cops, but John uses his supernatural abilities to evade the cops. Of course, the cloak helps him escape and Greg leaves a trail of blood behind him. In fact, the cloak can even make people teleport against their will, which is what Greg does while the cops were questioning Scarlet. The suit obeys only the one who possesses it and would do anything the person wants. In the end, Scarlet gains possession of the suit and has Greg killed. In a desperate bid to rid herself of the malevolent cloak, Scarlet sets it ablaze. However, her efforts seem futile as she discovered the cloaks mysteriously hanging in her own closet. As she investigates this uncanny recurrence, a pair of menacing, shadowy arms emerge from within the cloak, ensnaring her in its sinister grasp, leaving her fate shrouded in darkness. So you see, you cannot destroy the cloak, and you cannot keep it hungry. If its hunger is not satiated, it will consume the last possessor. <laughs> Satanic World Parallel Monsters VHS Viral 2014. In Parallel Monsters, directed by Nacho Vigalondo, the story introduces a Spanish inventor named Alfonso who achieves a breakthrough with a prototype for interdimensional travel. Upon activating his interdimensional portal, he discovers an exact replica of his garage and encounters his parallel self. Both Alfonsos realize they've opened a portal to each other's parallel universes and decide to explore their worlds for a brief time. It turns out that the parallel world was similar, but weird stuff was normal there. For instance, a satanic image on the wall and a ritualistic setup with a bag of organs suspended in the center of the room. Alfonso meets the parallel version of his wife, Marta, and two men named Oriel. It becomes evident that in his parallel world, Satan has supplanted God as the dominant deity, resulting in a dark and twisted reality. Alfonso is pursued and attacked by the two parallel Orioles, and during this confrontation, one of them reveals a horrific transformation, possessing a fanged creature instead of conventional male genitalia. Alfonso defends himself by using a screwdriver to fend off the assailants. In his attempt to return to his world, Alfonso encounters the parallel Marta, who reveals her own demonic attributes. Simultaneously, in Alfonso's home in the Earthly Dimension, the parallel Alfonso assaults Earthly Marta with his demonic shaft. In a climactic series of events, the parallel Alfonso is devoured by the parallel Marta, emphasizing the nightmarish nature of this parallel universe. So people from this world cannibalize each other like it's nobody's business. The real Alfonso manages to shut down the interdimensional portal 
but is injured in the process. Earthly Marta arrives on the scene, mistakenly assuming that her husband was the attacker, and she proceeds to stab the real Alfonso multiple times. Director Nacho Vigalondo skillfully explores the concept of parallel universes in a chilling and provocative manner, incorporating sexual and demonic elements with a satanic undertone, creating a truly unsettling and memorable cinematic experience. Reanimated Skeletons Bone Storm, VHS Viral 2014. In Bone Storm, directors Justin Benson and Aaron Scott Moorhead created a praiseworthy piece. The story revolves around skateboarders Jason and Danny, whom a boy named Taylor records while they perform stunts. Unbeknownst to Jason and Danny, Taylor wants to make a snuff film. The trio embarks on their journey and in their quest to find an abandoned skate park in Tijuana, Mexico, they pick up Taylor's friend, Sean. However, they end up in an abandoned flood channel, but one of the skateboarder's arms gets brutally injured, and it bleeds on a pentagram. A mysterious woman suddenly appears in the flood channel, gruesomely severing Taylor's arm. Simultaneously, a horde of cultists come out of nowhere and attack the group. Although the boys manage to kill the cultists, they reanimate. Furthermore, the blood spilled during this gruesome battle serves as a catalyst, awaking a demonic creature. The deceased cultists take the form of walking skeletons and chase Jason and Danny, while Taylor falls victim to the demon's ravenous appetite, camera and all. Directors Benson and Moorhead, known for their innovative cinematographic techniques, masterfully integrated the reanimated skeletons into the narrative, presenting them as demonic minions of the awakened entity. While the demon itself may have had limited screen time, it stands as one of the most formidable and terrifying entities in all the segments of the franchise. <laughs> Rothma, a grotesque, half-human, half-rat creature. Storm Drain, VHS 94, 2021. In Storm Drain, written and directed by Chloe Akuno, a new cult-like religion comes to light, which is led by a grotesque, half-human, half-rat creature called Ratma. The story follows Channel 6 news reporter, Holly Marciano, and her cameraman Jeff as they investigate local legend of the Ratman, rumored to reside in Westerfield, Ohio's storm drains. Upon descending into the storm drain to gather information, they encounter homeless encampments and an eerie, black slime-covered individual. When this person, seemingly influenced by a malevolent force, utters the word Ratma, and begin spitting up black liquid. Holly and Jeff attempt to escape, but are captured by the denizens of the sewers. As they are taken deeper into the sewers, they meet a religious priest of the cult who explains that it is the dawn of a new order and summons the grotesque creature known as Ratma, described as a half-human, half-rat entity, revered as a god by the sewer dwellers. Ratma emits a black, corrosive liquid that the minister uses to fatal effect, pouring it over Jeff's face, resulting in a gruesome and agonizing death as it dissolves his flesh. Holly, still alive, is presented before Ratma, who responds with a growl of approval as she screams in terror. Not only was Ratma a truly disturbing monster visually, but it also had a psychological effect on people. In the end, Holly seemed to be losing her mind, and she was inexplicably substituting random words with Ratma. Also, the victims, like Holly, could throw up the black goo on others, leading to their death, just as the cameraman had died. The film underscores the malevolent power of Ratma, not only manifesting in the physical transformation of individuals, but also subjugating their minds and wills, ultimately leading them to become fervent followers of this nightmarish entity. Holly's eerie sign-off with Hail Ratma serves as a chilling testament to the extent of the influence and terror that Ratma wields over these ensnared in its dark grasp. The Reanimated and Decapitated Corpse the Empty Wake, VHS 94, 2021. In The Empty Wake, written and directed by Simon Barrett, a young woman named Haley is tasked with hosting a wake at the Jensen family home for a man named Andrew Edwards. Andrew's family requests that the entire service be recorded throughout the night. Haley, alone in the funeral home, begins to hear peculiar sounds coming from the casket. To her shock, she notices that the casket has shifted on the bier. Alarmed, she contacts her colleague, Tim, who reassures her that the noises are likely caused by gases being released from the body. As a thunderstorm rages outside, a man named Gustav arrives at the wake, claiming to be a relative of Andrew, but he says an incantation in Hungarian before abruptly departing. It's not before long that Haley finds out the casket has tipped over. 
the lid is open and Andrew's body is missing. Haley is suddenly attacked by Andrew's reanimated but decapitated corpse, and she temporarily distracts Andrew's reanimated corpse. However, Andrew's remaining functional eye locks onto her, allowing the rest of the body to locate and attack her. In the end, Haley gets possessed by Andrew's spirit. Mechanical Human Hybrid, The Subject, VHS 94, 2021. In The Subject, written and directed by Timo Chianto, the story delves into the creation of mechanical human hybrids, a disturbing and grotesque experiment conducted by the deranged scientist by Dr. James Suhandra. These mechanical hybrids, often referred to as subjects, are kidnapped humans who were fit with mechanical components. Their bodies are modified with cybernetic enhancements, featuring a combination of human flesh and robotic parts. For instance, one subject, referred to as Subject 98, is equipped with spring-powered blades for arms while another, Subject 99, or SA, is a functioning cyborg with a body that responds to speech. They retain some semblance of their former human selves, but are distorted by the invasive cybernetic modifications. Subject 98, for instance, exhibits a human torso, but possesses mechanical arms with deadly spring-powered blades. SA, on the other hand, features a partially mechanical face and body. The mechanical hybrids are granted enhanced physical capabilities and strength due to their cybernetic enhancements. Subject 98's spring-powered blades grant him formidable close combat abilities, while SA's cyborg body responds to speech commands and exhibits advanced functionality, while their actions are largely controlled and manipulated by Dr. James. These mechanical hybrids retain some degree of their former selves. SA, in particular, struggles with retaining her memories and resisting her transformation into a mindless creation. Buddha, Shredding, VHS 99, 2022. In Shredding, directed and written by Maggie Levin, the story introduces the concept of the Buddha, which is inspired by Indian folklore and represents vengeful spirits. In the film, the Buddha is associated with the condemned colony underground music venue, where all four members of the punk band Bitch Cat were killed during a chaotic stampede. The Buddha in the films is believed to be the vengeful spirit of these deceased band members. They appear as angry and vengeful entities. When they manifest, they are shown as spectral figures that have been transformed into monstrous versions of their former selves. Themselves. The Buddha in Shredding demonstrates supernatural abilities that go beyond the natural realm. They have the power to physically interact with the living, as seen when they attack and dismember the members of the Rack Band. Additionally, they seem to possess the ability to manipulate technology as they take control of the group's camera to document their gruesome actions. In Indian folklore, a boot or Buddha is a type of spirit or supernatural entity, often associated with individuals who have died prematurely or in traumatic circumstances. Boots are believed to be restless and vengeful, and they may seek to harm the living in various ways. They are believed to be most active at night and in secluded or desolate places. Rituals and offerings are often made to appease and ward off these spirits. <laughs> Giltina, The Reaper, Suicide Bid, VHS 99, 2022. In the film Suicide Bid, written and directed by Johannes Roberts, the primary villain is the vengeful spirit of a young girl named Giltina. Giltina is also a mythological figure derived from Lithuanian folklore. She is often associated with death, mortality, and the afterlife. In the film's narrative, Giltina used to be a young girl who went missing from a grave. While some believe that she went to the underworld, no one really knew. But what we do know is that she became a chilling urban legend in Suicide Bid. She is depicted as a restless spirit or ghoul. Her appearance is ethereal and otherworldly. In line with her role as a figure of death and the afterlife, Giltina possesses supernatural powers, including the ability to interact with the living from beyond the grave. She is shown to have a physical presence as she punches through the lid of the coffin to attack Lily, the protagonist, in a moment of terror. Now, Lily was in the grave because that was the challenge she had to complete to become a sorority sister. In fact, Giltina's legend is also intertwined with this hazing ritual in sororities, where she was dared to spend a night buried in a coffin in a graveyard to gain acceptance. According to the legend, Giltina vanished, rumored to have crawled into the underworld, creating an aura of mystery and fear surrounding her. In the film's climax, Lily, the protagonist, makes a deal with Giltina, offering the sorority sisters as replacement victims in exchange for her own 
soul being spared. So Giltina is capable of making bargains or deals related to life and death. Anyone can be a monster. Ozzy's Dungeon VHS 99 in Ozzy's Dungeon, Deborah is the domineering and manipulative mother of Donna, one of the contestants on the children's game show Ozzy's Dungeon. Her primary motivation is to ensure that her daughter wins the show at any cost, as she sees it as the only way for their poverty-stricken family to escape their rundown neighborhood in Detroit. Deborah is depicted as ruthless and willing to go to extreme lengths to achieve her goal. The former host of Ozzy's Dungeon, whose name is not specified, is both a villain and a victim. He was the one because of whom the poor girl became crippled. The injury could have been less severe had he chosen to stop the show so that Donna's injury could be treated immediately, but later he's subjected to various torturous versions of the show's challenges under the threat of acid being poured on him. Despite his pleas for mercy, Donna's family continue to torment him because they want him to ensure Deborah meets Ozzy. But in reality, Donna is the ultimate villain of the story. In a shocking turn of events, Donna's wish is revealed to be the catalyst for the horrifying climax of the story. Instead of choosing a benevolent wish that could improve her family's life, Donna makes the decision to wish for their deaths by a tentacled monster. Donna's wish demonstrates a complete transformation from a sympathetic character to the story's central villain, her willingness to sacrifice her own family for personal gain, underscores the depth of her sinister nature desires. Donna's wish is manifested in the form of a monstrous creature that unleashes a destructive beam, causing the faces of her family members to melt, and the segment ends with her smiling at the camera, so you know she's a cold-blooded killer. Sandra the Gawkers VHS 99 2022 In The Gawkers, Sandra is initially introduced as an attractive blonde woman who has recently moved into the house across the street from Brady and Dylan's residence. Sandra's physical appearance exudes an air of allure and sophistication which immediately catches the attention of the neighborhood's teenagers. Sandra's yard stands out from the others, adorned with several stone busts, but they are more than statues. However, beneath her seemingly ordinary exterior lies a chilling secret. Sandra is not what she appears to be. She is revealed to be a Gorgon, a mythical creature from Greek mythology. As a Gorgon, Sandra possesses the extraordinary ability to change her appearance at will, concealing her true form behind the guise of a beautiful woman. Her most distinctive and horrifying trait is her hair, which is composed of snakes. You know, like Medusa? Sandra's character is complex, evoking both fascination and fear. She is not just a victim of voyeurism, but a formidable being who takes swift and lethal action to protect her privacy. Her power to turn those who cross her into stone statues serves as a stark reminder of the dire consequences of invading her personal space. Ah! Something's here! Ah! Yukobon, Fergus, and Mabel to Helen Back, VHS 99, 2022. In the eerie depths of hell, Nate and Troy find themselves surrounded by a nightmarish menagerie of demons each more grotesque and menacing than the last. The demons of hell are a diverse and terrifying bunch. Some are massive, hulking beasts with gnarled and mottled flesh that oozes with vile ichor. Their eyes gleam with malevolence, burning like the smoldering embers in the perpetual darkness of their domain. These brutes possess incredible strength, capable of tearing souls apart with their bare, clawed hands. Others are more cunning and deceptive, with serpent-like features, forked tongues, and hypnotic, mesmerizing eyes. Hell's demons are relentless hunters driven by an insatiable appetite for torment and suffering. They revel in sadistic games, setting traps and snares. They prey upon the despair of those lost in the abyss. Infernal creatures of hell are not only physical horrors, but also masters of dark magic. They can conjure hellfire, casting ominous shadows and unleashing waves of searing agony upon their foes. With their vile incantations, they can manipulate the very fabric of hell itself, creating nightmarish illusions and phantasms to further torment their victims. In the film, a coven of witches seek to invoke Yukobon's dark influence during their ritual, using a willing vessel, Kirsten, to channel its power. The encounter with Fergus in the story serves a disruptive catalyst, dragging Nate and Troy into hell 
hell and setting them on their treacherous journey. Furcus is a symbol of chaotic forces at play within the underworld, an entity that thrives on chaos and revels in the suffering of mortals. Mabel is a damned soul trapped in hell. She possesses knowledge of the underworld and a deep resentment for Yukabon making her a sinister but valuable guide for Nate and Troy in their quest to return to Earth. Desperate for freedom, Mabel bargains with the two best friends, offering to guide them to Yukabon in exchange for having her name written in the witch's spellbook, a potential ticket to salvation. As Nate and Troy navigate the labyrinth, they quickly learn the survival depends not only on physical prowess, but also on wit and cunning. For these demons are not just monstrous adversaries, they are the embodiment of Hell's malevolent essence, lurking in every shadow and lurking behind every twisted rock, ready to drag lost souls into an eternity of despair and suffering. If you like this video, do let us know in the comments below. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone!